evening and welcome to all of you by identifying yourself and the society or body you represent. I'm Anastasia Berry, I'm Policy Manager at the MS Society and I'm also one of the co-chairs of the Disability Benefits Consortium. Great. Uh, good morning, my name is Laura Dewar, I'm a Policy Officer at the charity Gingerbread, which is the charity that represents single parents. Uh, my name's Ayaz Manji, I'm Senior Policy and Campaigns Officer at Minds, the mental health charity. I'm um, Maeve McGoldrick, I'm Head of Policy and Campaigns at Crisis, which is the National Homeless Charity. Brilliant. Heidi? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, principally, what we are interested in is, um, with managed migration being pushed back, it's what happens to people who are naturally migrated across, um, and some by accident almost. I'd like to start off asking you all, who within the, the groups of people that you look after or support, who um, risks losing out financially the most? What, if anything, can be done to mitigate, mitigate any financial loss? And overall, in your conclusion, what does it do if they're match, naturally migrated in terms of their ability to get or keep in work? Anastasia, do you want to start? Um, so for us, um, disabled people and people with long-term health conditions are definitely the people who are most impacted um, and that comes across the whole um, of the universal credit process um, but in particular um, with the elements that identify them as needing extra support so like the severe disability premium the enhanced disability premium um, and even though as you said there are um, there's the SDP gateway which stops people moving over actually people are still being moved over by mistake because they might not know that they're entitled to that there's confusion um, with the people that they speak to in terms of getting the advice and information um, and those people who are entitled to or getting um, enhanced disability premium aren't protected by that either um, so they lose out on the transitional protection what talking about what in the people that you're supporting are there some sort of average figures um, I'm, I'm not sure I'd have to pass that over to... Or perhaps you can come back to us afterwards if you yeah. can find that information yeah. out. Yeah. So can anything be done to, um, to mitigate that or is it, you know, last chance to loom when you move across to UC, that's the end of it? Um, I think the fact that they, the government have recognised that um, losing SDP is significant for people uh, by the fact that they're going to compensate and they've stopped people um, naturally migrating over is an opportunity for them to look at other groups that um, might be triggered and losing out financially as well um, and um, particularly other people entitled to disability benefits um, looking at why they can't be considered within that group to stop those people from naturally migrating as right, well. Okay. Um, and any influence on their ability to move into work? By being, sorry, um, if people are naturally migrated, um, given that you see as a, as a whole system is, is designed to support people to get into work and stay in work and increase their hours, is the effect of somebody accidentally or otherwise being moved across prematurely, what does that do for their chances of finding work? Okay, I think, um, so 80% of people with MS um, have to give up work within 15 years of their diagnosis, yeah. and which means that they have a fall in their income levels anyway. Yeah. So being naturally migrated over and losing money at a time when you've already lost money, you're having to cope with other stresses um, within your life, I think that you know, is difficult enough to find employment there. And for some people, moving into work is not appropriate, whether you are yeah. losing money or gaining money from that. Um, I think one of the other issues is around um, the permitted work rules under legacy benefits and the work allowance and the tapers so if you are already doing some level of work under legacy benefits while there's no cliff edge under universal credit you still could miss out in those initial stages. Derek did you want to come in? No sorry I thought you looked like you were just to give me sorry thank you. Okay. Um, well in terms of universal credit um, single parents make up a quarter of all the current people who've moved over to universal credit uh, there are financial implications. Oh, so moved over, you mean that have naturally migrated? Have naturally already. migrated. Okay. Gosh, I didn't realise that statistic. Well. Yeah. And of those, uh, as well as a financial implication for single parents, universal credit uh, rules mean that different groups of single parents need to look for work. So it includes people who have children who are aged three and four who now need to look for work. And it's actually 42,500 people who have a child who's aged three and four who are a single parent on universal credit. So it's a financial implication, but it's also a practical implication. Mm -hmm. So that group of parents are now within the system and need to look for work. 
Um, and, and is that a shock to the system if you're naturally migrated and that wasn't an expectation before? Uh, I would think so, yes, I think it is. Uh, and um, in, in terms of uh, criteria of people who tend to be worse off, who've moved over, we can make, um, we can say people who are in receipt of maternity allowance, people who are under 25, people who have a disability or their children have a disability, the disabled uh, and also a carer or incapable of work due to sickness and have capital over £6,000. Those are the general terms where people are worse, worse off. We actually have to do usually a better off calculation for people. Some people are better off and some people are worse off and it really is pretty complicated and, as and you see from the evidence. Inside. Well because people's childcare costs different amounts, people's housing costs different amounts, so it's not a straightforward way. You can make generalisations. And, and are you um, just on that, because you're absolutely right, that's one of the things I, I suspect a lot of work coaches would like claimants to have done that before they come to them, because of course once you're on the system and you've had your first point your work yeah. coach, it's too late, you're in. Yeah. So how, ma how many people do you think you're catching in that way and helping them before they make their UC claim? Um, um, it's, the right it's, it's difficult to judge, I think because Universal Credit has had quite a negative uh, press, it's, it, it's, it means that probably someone is more likely to phone our helpline okay. than not be because of that, but when I spoke, spoke to our helpline team this week, they said, oh, they'd be so flooded if, if it was all the people right. who, who wanted a better off calculation. But it is a way that um, we are capturing okay. and actually giving better off. And some people are better off under universal credit. I can give you, you asked for financial, yes, the financial well, can I just say, the committee was visiting in, in Neil's constituency yesterday, a school, had a group of mothers. Yeah. When universal credit was uh, mentioned, yeah. uh, four-fifths of them screamed, I hate it. Right. So that's the, that's the background. Yeah. I mean, one wasn't on, but all the others were on. Yeah. One was um, okay because she'd set up self-employment, so she was protected for the first year. All the others found life almost impossible. Mm. So... The, that's the background, yeah. sadly, or otherwise, to this benefit. So in terms of um, the financial implications, mm -hmm. uh, someone who phoned our helpline, a single parent who's a carer of two children with disabilities, and they get disability living allowance, uh, and uh, she's moved over to universal credit and will be £70 worse off than she would be under legacy benefits. A single parent who's... That, that's a week. Yes. Yep. And that's substantial. Yeah, For yeah, someone on the low income, that's a substantial money, amount. Yeah. A single parent who is aged 22 was told that um, he will get £15 less per week under universal credit than legacy benefits because he is aged under 25. Again, that's £15 is a substantial amount if you're, um, if you're on a low um, income. Um, in, in terms of when people move into work, Overall, with universal credit, um, the Resolution Foundation have calculated that 60% of single parents will be worse off and 40% will be better off. If we're going to talk about work, can I just yeah. um, also come up, uh, can I also talk about the issue of um, natural uh, migration for people after they've taken temporary work? We have got questions okay. coming up. Oh, have you? Oh, I'll right, cover yes. it under that then. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Because that's an unusual bounce of, of people moving yes, into it, it, isn't is. it? Yeah. Steve, did you want to tell us something? Yeah, I was just curious. I mean, it sounds like you do a fair amount of work with people trying to identify if they were going to be better or worse off. Yeah. But do you have any idea how much time you would spend per individual claimant trying to work that out? Um, well, we do um, most of that support we do through uh, our, our helpline. I mean, uh, when I spoke to our helpline staff about, um, I was coming to uh, to talk the committee, um, they say it definitely makes their calls longer. I mean, obviously, under legacy benefits, they used to be, you know, they used to have to go through uh, people's individual circumstances, but it definitely adds a, a, a layer to those, to those calls. Uh, people staffing the helpline, how much longer now calls are? I'm just trying to get uh, some idea of what the resource demand... If this is complicated... And yeah. the decision is, I could end up worse off. Then, then it's important to people, obviously. Yeah. I'm just curious to know what is the resource demand to try and see if people can be. 
properly advised. It, it, it is, a, it is um, an added resource for organisations like you know like us. We're not we're not a large organisation, yeah. um, but obviously we want it to be right for those single yes. parents. We want them to have the right advice. Displaced, isn't it, into the, third, the support's being displaced into the third sector. Yeah, definitely. Well, we're also interested in knowing how the CABs operate their wraparound care service and how much time they will actually really need for each claimant to make that a reality. Mm. All right? Shall Anything else on? you wanted to add on work, Laura? Or is um, no, not if there's, um, uh, if there's another question around temporary work, then that's fine. Oh, yes. um, so in terms of the groups of people we support, um, I guess the two uh, people who are most impacted by natural migration uh, the first is people in receipt of disability premiums, so um, yeah. for us that would tend to be people with um, severe and enduring mental health problems who either live alone or with another disabled person and who are responsible for their own care, mm. as that's broadly what would entitle you to those premiums. Uh, the, the other group are people who are in work but either earning low income or working a limited number of hours um, because of the provisions and tax credits and permitted work which aren't mirrored in universal credit. Um, when you talk about financial losses, that can be anywhere on the lower end and probably more unusually, uh, about £100 a month, but more often than that we're seeing 200 300 sometimes more pounds a month, particularly for people who are in work. And one thing that I think is really important for us is that it's very hard to see this as a sort of uh, neat or clean edge of kind of winners and losers on the balance sheet, because often what's happening is when people are naturally migrating, an awful lot of other things are happening at the same time. Um, to take an example, um, a colleague at Local Mind was talking to me about one of their clients uh, named Emma, who she uh, ended up naturally migrating um, after having a PIP reassessment and losing her entitlement to PIP. Um, and she ended up, as a result of all of that, being worse off by about £200 a month. But at the same time, she, um, HMRC had discovered a historic um, overpayment, so her first UC claim was about £120 less than it should be. She was asked to go for another work capability assessment after migrating, even though that shouldn't have happened. Um, and as a result of all of these pressures that were happening at the same time in the transition, she started to develop suicidal thoughts during that time. Um, she found it very difficult even to engage with the advisor at the local mine to carry on attending her appointments. And she actually needed quite a lot of help from friends and family to get to the point where they could start working through all of those issues. Um, so I think when we talk to people, there is obviously the impact of that straight financial loss, but in almost every case there's something else going on there as well. Yeah. Um, so in terms of mitigating, I think we do think, like um, some of the organisations which gave evidence last week, that um, we do need to see natural migration paused in a, in a greater range of circumstances, particularly for now people. How would they pause it? So I this think is one of our dilemmas, how do they do that? I think the recommendation that I, th I think the committee heard last week, for example, around um, ex expanding the gateway that the government put in place for severe disability premium to other groups um, could work. And I, I take the point that, that there's risks around mm. complexity in that. Um, but the suggestion of, for example, PIP being something that um, if you're in receipt of PIP, then you don't migrate. Um, for the situations we're seeing, actually quite a few of them uh, would be avoided if, if that was in place because... It might be how you're getting other disability premiums, it might be how you're getting certain support and tax credits. Um, so I think we're probably quite open that we don't have the exact solution, but it seems like if there's will to do it, um, you could take the decision the government's made around SDP and you could yeah. apply that far, far wider. Okay, thank you. May. Um, it's a really difficult, again, uh, question to answer, and I think um, because we're, as a homeless charity, we're seeing people, A, with significant housing need, and B, um, at the point of crisis when things have gone wrong. So people coming through our doors are a mix of those um, that were full under managed migration and natural migration. And I guess sort of the ultimate message we're seeing is they all have support needs. And the system, in the way we've cut it around natural and uh, managed migration, is designed around administrative needs rather than support needs. Yeah. And it's unfortunate because I think this, we make the same mistake in the benefit system time and time again of, you know, we design things around benefit types rather than around... i just say what a powerful support. statement that is. Mm. You've just said that this system designed around administrative needs, not support needs. It's all about efficiency for the department, isn't it's, it? Well, it's, it's, um, it's been like that for forever. The benefit mm. system is always, yeah. you know, in the old uh, system we used to have uh, around benefit type rather than individual sort needs in the assessment. Yeah. And we're carrying that through into universal credit. So, you know, in reality, if you were to design this again, it would be how do we identify those that are vulnerable and for us that have a risk of homelessness or housing instability 
and we put them through a more protected system and yeah. we provide financial security and individual support to address their needs. But there's another proportion of people that will be fine and they'll either be well better off and therefore don't need financial support and or they don't need that individual one-to-one mm -hmm. advice to help them through the system. And we just, because we haven't designed it in that way, we have pockets of vulnerability in both natural migration and in managed migration. And we are seeing that through coming through our services that people don't fall under one system or the other. So I think the, um, there's a couple of, of um, uh, issues that are coming out under natural migration in particular that's affecting our client group. And it's things like um, the severe disability premium was a significant issue and we really welcome the change in that. What we would say is there's still a backlog <coughs> of people that were affected by it that need uh, to, you know, the, the investment needs to be brought forward for them as well. Right. Um, another group that we're seeing is uh, when people are moving on to natural migration and they're on, uh, they've had their work capability assessment, that that information has been carried through, so there's errors, and they've been moved on to the wrong type of um, uh, conditionality group as a result of it. Um, and that's through natural migration Through now. natural migration, yes. Yeah, so we've yeah. had that come through some of our uh, case studies. Again, administrative errors is making, just rather than the, the design of the system itself, is making people move on to a different type. Um, and then I guess the third group that we're seeing um, is uh, people that are taking up small bits of work and because of the uh, zero work allowance under universal credit that they're financially worse This off. is for a single person for a single with, with person. no healthcare needs? Or yes, whatever, yeah. with uh, earning small amounts of money that because there's no work allowance yeah. under universal credit and historically there, there was under working tax credits, they're yeah. seeing that drop in income. And I guess the point for homelessness is it's that drop in income combined with um, the delays and errors in universal credit and combined with other cuts, particularly local housing lines. And then your, your life spirals out of control, you get a sanction and then... It's, it's the cumulative impact of yeah. the money that you're losing is just putting the housing at severe risk. And really, I guess, if we were to design this, this transition onto universal credit, one of our fundamental principles would be to ensure that we don't cause homelessness as a result yeah. of it. Don't cause, sorry, homelessness. homelessness as a result gosh. of it. And we really need to think about in the delivery, uh, both personal delivery and administrative delivery, how do we ensure we stabilise housing through managed mm. or natural migration onto universal credit? Can I ask one final question, yes, um, Maeve? Yeah. Um, in your experience with the organisation you work for, or your colleagues, I don't know how long you've been there. Um, not that there is a type of person who finds himself in a homelessness situation, mm -hmm. but are you seeing any changes in the types of clients because of you see now put, being in that precarious system that perhaps 10 years ago you wouldn't have? Is there any change? I think there's... Brief on this, mm -hmm. Certainly. Uh, I think there's a change. There's a change because there's a homelessness prevention agenda with government and, and a commitment to do so. So we're seeing more people come through the door as our local authorities. There's a real opportunity there when people are going to local authorities for a housing problem to do with universal credit that they should be speaking to work coaches and identifying them as this is somebody at risk of losing their home. How do we make sure universal credit functions to stabilise their housing? Right. And there's a, there's a real opportunity, as we talked about earlier, of this sort of um, absence of advice services that existed 10 years ago within the welfare sector. There's a real opportunity for local authorities, particularly in the housing element, to be, play a more proactive role in identifying need if somebody's universal credit isn't working effectively or if they don't get sufficient income from natural migration, that they need to speak to the work coach and something needs to be issued, so whether it's transitional protection and or a package of money advice support to ensure that they actually don't yeah. fall into rent arrears. And I've often thought about we should have a system in mm -hmm. universal credit where there are platinum customers, those mm -hmm. that absolutely need handling with kid gloves and need yeah. manually taking through the system, not just dumped in like in an I, Daniel Blake yeah. kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's most of us, really. Mm -hmm. Well, you and I probably be all right. Well, I will certainly wouldn't be. Well, the IT. No, well. Chris. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Maeve, I think you've touched on some of this, but maybe if you could... Uh, uh, did you have any case examples um, where national migration is leaving claimants at the risk of homelessness? Where national migration is at risk of causing homelessness? Yes. It's the, um, so what we have seen, and I've uh, given some examples of that in our evidence that we've submitted, uh, there was one example where we had a pensioner, and we don't often, you know, pension is in our area of expertise, but somebody that was advised by a different organisation to migrate uh, over to universal credit then hadn't calculated how much income and he'd been relying on housing benefit and his private pension. Obviously a private pension is now going to be deducted under universal credit so he was significantly worse off as a result of that. He's in rent arrears and he's now coming through our services. 
uh, a similar case we had with somebody who has been working 20, uh, 25 hours for the last eight years because they've got a health condition and they've been able to survive on that under the old system. When they've moved to universal credit, they're now falling into rent arrears because they've come through our doors again. So we are, I mean, at the, at the stage we're at with national migration is quite early. So what we're seeing is people build up cumulative debt. We know with homelessness there's always a lag after poverty. You, you, eviction comes a couple of months later. So there's a real, you know, there is a huge risk <coughs> that people aren't, who aren't coping with the drop in income won't be able to sustain that current tenancy. Yeah, thank you. Have any of the others, um, with your um, people that you work with, seen an increased risk of homelessness? Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, our helpline um, has said that they've seen an increase in the number of calls um, around homelessness. Um, and also, um, the Disability Benefits Consortium recently carried out a survey which closed um, earlier this week, so the results are quite pre preliminary. Um, but we've found that around 70% have borrowed from family or friends and 30% have had to borrow from a loan or credit card. Um, because of the debt that they have found themselves in. And um, a person with MS told us that they've had to use food banks to feed their family. They're now nine months behind on council tax, and if it wasn't for their mother-in-law, they would have been evicted because they couldn't pay the rent. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely a, an issue. Laura? Um, yes, I well, de definitely seeing a, a drop in income and people using um, food banks. And we've had examples of people where housing, housing associations have sort of stepped in and are being you know are letting there be a, a pause in rent so it's definitely having an effect on housing associations but i wouldn't um but like i say mo most of the examples that we see are people who see a drop in income and are, are having to access food banks and are are going into debt borrowing from friends and like i say i have got examples of um housing associations stepping in and, and just to echo that, um, I think we've certainly seen uh, lots of individual cases, particularly around severe disability premium, but um, <clears throat> not exclusively, where people have started to kind of enter that cycle of debt. And I think particularly as well, um, when you're unwell, when you're struggling with your mental health, I think that first thing that starts to push you under, you then get into that cycle of problems, which moves you closer and closer towards homelessness. So we, we have been seeing cases of that. Very good. Thank you. Derek? Um, I want to talk a bit about the term natural migration because actually it's quite deceptive because it kind of gives you the impression that it's all a smooth process that just naturally works and that one day I'm on the old uh, it's like, um, system of benefits and then I get a letter saying, no, I'm on this, everything's fine. Um, actually, that's clearly not the case. Do you, what, why, what is it that a job centre and work coaches hopefully will have a lot of data on an individual and information and they'll know what that person is entitled to and what they can and can't do. Why is it that somehow, is it intended that somehow it all just stops and then starts and then that, it takes a while then for people to get to where they probably would have been before under a new system? And is that as the department intends? I mean, are people, are there practical issues where with natural migration, it means claimants face larger financial difficulties than the department intends. Is it is about the process rather than the intention? Um, hmm. I th if I understand your question right, I think um, it's, it's. Do you mean about how this is being delivered by yeah, the it, department? It, it, yeah. Um, I would say, I mean, the, the onus ultimately is on the individual rather mm. than the department. That's, That's right. one of the fun starting principles that um, is questionable. I compare this actually to um, the smart readers that are used on the electric and water companies at the moment. And, you know, that's a huge change management project. And what they've done is allowed customers to test out for a period of time how better off you would be if you moved to a smart reader rather than your mm. current electricity bills. And they know that it's coming in at a certain date, but you have that time to prepare. And we haven't really taken that change management approach with moving people on to universal credit. So the onus is entirely on the individual <coughs> to understand the, the change in their income and the process of what they need to do in order to make that happen. And I think the, the most effective thing, again, for homelessness, we've recommended to introduce housing and homelessness specialists within the job centre for a number of reasons, but particularly around natural migration, that mm. they could identify the partnerships and the protocols that would be needed both in terms of data sharing and the handling of the system to enable a smoother transition. But we've taken all those specialists out of the, the job centre. You know, we don't have the resource of the support within 
the work coach facilities. So you either get that externally from a, an advice sector that is no longer mm. really there, or you invest that back into for a transition period on the inverse credit in job centres. Can I ask you? So, so um, I appreciate that. But if the if the department itself is saying there is a group of people that they should not be required to engage with job centres or look for work, and yet somehow because of the natural migration that that is happening. What's going wrong then? What, what, where is it going wrong in the system? Where you have, so for example, there might be someone with a mental health issue or severe disability or something else, where somehow the natural migration means, as you say, that the ownership is on them and their families if they exist mm -hmm. to, carry, to take that journey. Whereas all the information that's needed already sits with the job centre. Am I not... Um, Am I um, being a bit naive on this? Uh, no, I'm just not sure that yeah. all information does sit with the jobs. No, no and, and I think Maeve's, uh, I think Maeve's, what Maeve said about it being the onus on the individual, I think yeah. as well with people's lives, they get advice from their work coach or they phone the Universal Credit Helpline or they have a contact with the local authority if they're on housing benefit. And so they have, and, and we have calls where people have just been given totally different advice as yeah. to whether they need to Thank move you. over to UC, uh, because it's so complicated. I mean, and mm -hmm. you know, the, I'm sure all the evidence that you've seen about the, the triggers, you know, so it's a trigger to move to Universal Credit if you're you've got housing benefit, you're you're on housing benefit, and you live in a borough, and then you move borough, then mm -hmm. you have to go on to UC. If you move within the borough, you don't have to. If you're in work and you increase your hours, you don't have to go to UC, if you decrease your hours, you do have to move right, to UC. Okay. It's incredibly complicated. It's an it's incredibly complicated system. And so what tends to happen, I'm sure, if you're at the job centre and you're an advisor, you think, oh, someone should be on UC. Their circumstances have changed. Yeah. I don't think, you know, I, I think some of it, 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 the complexity of it means that that's, yeah. that, that is what is happening quite a lot. Yeah, you definitely hear that people get the you know confusing advice conflicting advice wrong advice and this is from people i would say that um they would believe that they could rely on and trust yes, exactly them, right. you know they yeah. they're ringing the universal credit helpline so why would that person yes. not be giving me the right information um and we hear again people going from um the department to local authorities and neither kind of knowing which the other what the other should be saying so it's confusing and the thing is if that happens and you do move over there's no way back so mm. if you are if you do lose mm. out because you've got the wrong information and the wrong advice then th there's no way back from that i think one of the other issues as well is around um um appeals as well so while you're waiting for a mm. mandatory reconsideration or an appeal again not having to claim universal credit and then being um you know losing out financially yeah. and not being able to go back to the thing that was an error in the first place just doesn't seem fair right. mm -hmm. just to um sorry just to add to that and to come back to um i think you mentioned your question around the, the data that uh did yeah that's really right, hold yeah. about people i think one area which for us has been really stark yeah. is what happens uh, when people who are currently on esa who haven't yeah. been through an assessment that's right. decision about their fitness for work when they then naturally migrate, because in a lot of cases we're seeing that that decision hasn't been followed, hasn't been taken over with them, um, yeah. either for days or for weeks or potentially for months. And the consequences when that happens can be really stark, because not only will people be being underpaid, potentially by around £300 a month, uh, they might be being asked to go through a whole other assessment that they don't need to go through. And as you mentioned, they're being required to engage with the job centre. And to put that into context, a third of the people in the ESA support group are there because the DWP says there is a risk to their physical or mental health mm, if they're required right, to yeah. engage with, um, with job centres. Uh, and so you have a group, and that often for mental health, that risk that we're talking about is risks related to suicide, to self-harm, mm. or to going to mental health crisis. So we have a group of people that the department has already assessed, it has right, information yeah. about them, um, but because it's not acting on that information or because it's taking too long to act on that information, uh, those people are undergoing real risks. And, okay. and for us, that's not an abstract problem. Uh, we've spoken to people um, who have seen their mental health deteriorate, who have found uh, the, the pressure of managing those appointments start to get unmanageable. Uh, and, and we do think the scenario where it's, it's a serious failure of the department's responsibility to safeguard people who are in quite vulnerable situations. And it, it's also, I should say, very fixable in that um, you could build the system, you could develop it so that from day one of somebody being uh, migrated, even through natural migration, 
they have that information there, they know how much that person should be being paid for the sort of disability element, mm -hmm. and they know what uh, requirements has been decided that person um, has to do to engage with Can I quickly pick up on that point? So that, that was trying to, you just clarified what I was trying to get at, so thank you very much. Um, so if you've got, if you have that sort of that situation, the ESA being going to natural migration, and you go through all the problems that you've described, will they eventually get the right components, components applied, or, or how does that sort itself out? So in the cases we've seen, it's pretty variable. A lot of what we see is it, it being a delay, so it might be taking right. weeks or months. But uh, one person I was speaking to recently, um, for her it took nine months to get that award, and she was leaving a note on her journal every single month. It was a different case manager applying every single month. Right. In the end, she went on Facebook, joined the Facebook support group, and someone there helped her stay on the phone until she got the right award added. Mm. Um, so that was nine months, that's definitely reduced income. But what we're also worried about is people who are just told you need another assessment, you need to go through it all again. Mm -hmm. uh, and people, because of that, often the dynamic they have in the department, um, and also just not really knowing much about universal credit or the system, mm -hmm. people often just accept that and say, okay, I'll need to portray myself and, and do the whole thing over again. So we don't have a sense in terms of numbers, but we're, we're seeing it happen in lots of different ways, and it's all quite concerning. And that's down to the local job centre often, presumably. And it, it will be, I think, local job centre, or potentially if it's about the, the right award getting, I think it can be a conversation between staff at DDP who work on ESA and staff who work on Universal okay. Credit. So right. I think there's probably, it's a manual process that's happening somewhere with case managers, which we really think shouldn't be being left to being a manual process. But it could vary across the country, yeah. depending on the... Mm. Thank you, Thank you. Rosie? Yes. Um, we kind of touched on this, but just taking it back a bit more basically, are the changes in circumstances which lead to claimants moving to UC without transitional protection reasonable in all of your experiences? It's pretty arbitrary, but, but because there's this group of people who are naturally migrating, and th there's going to be a whole group of people who are on managed migration, who people think they should be financially protected through transitional protection. It seems, it seems unfair that then there's this whole other group and significant numbers of people. Like I say, a quarter of a million single parents are on universal credit and have had no transitional protection. It just seems pretty arbitrary that a whole group of people don't get any transitional protection and are worse off under universal credit. I think it's I mean, also I just because of the timing of it. Point, it's crucial here that the department's got itself a name calling this uh, um, the nature of the migration as though it's a law of nature, whereas in fact it's a decision on their part. And they, that group is not protected, and those who are on managed migration are protected. Mm. I mean, that's, that's one of the things we've got to tackle as a committee, isn't it? I would say, um, I come back to the point I made earlier, that uh, these decisions are being made on practicalities rather than need. So your question about are they the right triggers, my response would be the triggers for transitional protection or financial support because transitional protection regulations haven't been laid so we don't know how effective they'll really be. But financial support in some shape or form should be there for people that are needed and are vulnerable and particularly are at risk of losing basics like their home, not necessarily because certain circumstances change and others won't because not everyone will need financial support but if, you, if your circumstances of change leave you more vulnerable and uh, at risk of things like losing your home, that's whenever the benefit system should be stepping in to provide that cushion. And the way we're designing it, it's not taking account of those financial needs. Okay. I'm sorry, it was, it was, and Derek, you made this quite not steep. You see, I can't remember any other major reform like this, where people moving people from one system to another, where they haven't been protected. I mean, that protection might last until two years or some major thing happens in their life. But we've never had a system of transferring people who are dependent on a certain level of income to a new benefit which the government wants everyone to be on, and then for large numbers of people to find themselves worse off. I mean, in, in reality, if there was more money invested in universal credit, particularly around the housing support and the work allowances, half of these problems wouldn't actually be an issue. So we wouldn't be having the same type of conversation in winners and losers and the concept of natural migration. So you would prefer us to think about on that mm -hmm. rather than arguing that everybody should be protected as I they move I think, on? I think, no, I think my point is that no, it's, I think certain people need financial support and we need to identify who they are. My point is that transitional protection isn't always the best route to do that. 
There's the other option of actually investing more in universal credit in itself. So when you do, through natural or managed right. migration, have changed the circumstances that you are better off That's or the same, same. Yeah. in your current situation, because we've designed a system where there's a drop in income, because right. we haven't, the Treasury hasn't invested effectively in so things like... It's a like double hit, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We're You're not getting protected exactly. to a system that's lower anyway. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Have you done any costings on that? Um, no, we will have costings coming out on, uh, on the LHA drop um, and the other wider effects that are due next week, but not on the transition in relation to moving to universal credit. Um, I think it is important to remember that transitional protection is there, but even if you're managed migrated, that, that that's not guaranteed, um, you know, as it could change anyway because of a change in circumstances or um, uh, because it erodes over time. Um, but the question around are the transitional uh, are the triggers reasonable? I, then no, I don't think they mm. are. Um, they're often triggered by things that are unavoidable, necessary, mm. um, and um, out of somebody's control and normally come at a time when people are finding life quite difficult anyway um, so for example people with MS might need to move home because they need um, certain types of adapted accommodation um, so why should something like that that they need um, lead to a loss of financial support um, yeah I, I'm, I'm not sure whether you're going to ask a question about the, in terms of about moving into work but I mean I think one of the areas particularly for single parents because welfare reform over the last 10 years has seen single parents of much younger children have to move into work from when they were 16, 11 years ago to three under universal credit. So work is, a, is obviously a big issue under welfare reform for this group and the principle of universal credit was that work was going to pay and I think one of the, the, the worst areas that we see is the amount of single parents who are too scared to take work too scared to take because of the nature of work work is not you know work can be temporary and precarious and um, I think the the examples of um, people who particularly have got younger children and don't need to under legacy benefits you've got a three-year-old child you take a temporary job at Christmas your work coach has probably said look you know Poundland's got um, temporary work do it good to get some work experience under your belt you do it for six weeks you transfer over to universal credit you will then lose 780 pounds a year you'll be worse off not only that you'll be under the universal credit rules and you have to look for work you go away from having a choice you have to look for work because you've now moved over to a different regime the universal credit regime where you're expected to work when your child is three a single parent in receipt of um, carers allowance um, uh, and in receipt of disability living allowance, a middle rate, would lose about £33 a week if a job doesn't work out and they transfer from legacy to a temporary job. Mm. And then that's, I mean... So you're doing your best to do the right you thing. Do, you're you're doing the work. whole principle of universal yes, credit yeah. and what should be positive about mm. universal credit. And I mean, and, and what's, what's really bad is the people who do that, who have no... Re who don't realise they're going to lose out. I think you've talked about, we've talked about people who are too scared to take a job, but also what about those people who've, who've, who've done that and who, who lose out? It just doesn't seem, doesn't really? seem right. Yeah, and it's really interesting that actually all of you are from charities that I see kind of on a daily basis as casework, particularly MS, which is one of the shocking things, I think. We've got a woman who's been waiting, I think, 52 weeks now, and we've been told that it, the average is about 63 just to sort her particular case out. And you see people come into your surgeries, and I should think it's the same for everyone, in their wheelchairs. They're not about to get better. They're not about to get some brilliant high-flying job. And, you know, I find that particularly horrible. It's, it's nice to see what you're all doing for people, really, so thank you. Steve? Um, well, I think we've got a fairly good idea about your concerns and criticisms about the, the way it's working. If the department wanted to do something to ensure that people did know before they transferred whether or not they would be better off under universal credit or the legacy benefit, what is the simple thing the department could do to make it easier for you as an organisation and for the individual as a claimant to know in advance what was going to happen? Um, 
better training and awareness of frontline mm. staff without without a doubt so work coaches and people who uh, claimants are coming into contact with who don't have the expertise and to understand the kind of complicated nature of mm. all the different elements and I think there has to be recognition from those people that um, that they can't give that advice and that they say, I don't know mm. what the answer is, I don't know if you're better or worse off here, I'm going to have to... Right, so do we need you. to, you say, better training and I and kind of <laughs> blank, well, you could have blanket training, but I guess that would be quite timely and costly. Do you mean specific staff identified who are properly trained who could then be the person who could give that... Yeah, they have advice. to be experts. It can't just be mm. a, a work coach right. or, you know... Kind or, of or, you could, or you could have a, a, a trigger before someone's application goes through that is literally flashed up that says, have you had a, a calculation? Do you need yeah. to move to universal credit? Right, so because that would be a the, very simple one. Because you could, you know... that, could, that uh, And also some way of there being... If someone has been given the wrong advice by the DWP and they have moved off and they're moved over and they are, they are worse off, there must be some way that that person should have some recompense. I don't know whether that's through transitional protection or something. Yeah. I was going to ask not, that that much, about but you, that. Could, but you could flash up something yeah. that stopped someone's, that stopped before their, their claim for universal credit started that, that said, have you had? I mean, you could even say people need independent advice. Mm. Okay, so training of specialist staff yeah. A flagging system yep. so that it's absolutely clear before you make the switch. And a triggers document, because the, trigger, the triggers that there are, I think, you know, I mean, they are mind-boggling, yeah. the documents that I've seen on triggers. But some of them are optional, so you have the thing that sometimes people have the option to move to universal credit, if they're going to be better off. Mm. And other people have the option. People should know that. And if they've been told, oh, you must move to universal credit when it was optional, again... Mm. I think there has to be some way that if that has then proved to be incorrect, that there's some way of either moving people back or compensating them. I was going to ask, I mean, if, you, if you've got any kind of... If you think about other kind of consumer-type legislation, you know, you buy something that isn't fit for purpose or turns out not to be what you thought it was, you can generally... Or you make a legal agreement, you can generally get out of it within a certain period of time, can't you? I mean, I, I am not quite sure why we don't offer the same consumer protection that we're, as a, you know, government offers everybody else. I don't know why it couldn't apply here. It's well. it universal credit. Yes, but it's look, it, it, if we want to avoid just saying we're going to scrap the whole system no, no, and sure. start all over again, which some people might want, if we don't want to go down that road, we've got to say, where are we now and what could you do about it? And I'm just trying to ascertain what... But you, but May, can I bring your point back onto the table? And that was, uh, the reform you'd like to see is the cuts restored. Yeah. If the cuts were restored, we wouldn't be having this conversation about all these protective mechanisms we must have to prevent people who are going to be made worse off from falling into the ditch. I mean, is, that, uh, yeah. is that acceptable or not? I think that that's exactly... I think the, the biggest change that could be made is to remove the financial drop mm -hmm. that people yeah. get through transition, and you will be dealing with a lot less problems. There will still be a certain level of vulnerability and a certain level of mm -hmm. intensive support that some people will need. And I, w what I would say is uh, a package of advice is good. Uh, come back to what we do with the electrics and, and water company, where they're, they design it from a customer experience. So you're given foresight of what will happen further down the line and you can trial that system out and there's a degree, and you have clear information. And in reality, the wiring is done behind the scenes. So Universal Credit, I remember when in its early days and it was sold, it was a very... Co the, the problem we have with so many difficulties is because the legacy system is so excruciatingly complex at the moment and that's what we're dealing with in this transition period. In the long term, moving to a simplified system is of benefit to everyone. But the process of doing that, that wiring needs to remain to be done behind the scenes. And at the moment, it's, it's being delivered on, on top of the, you know, the claimants picking all of that up and trying to unpick all of those complexities. So create a system that gives you very clear answers for a period of sustained time of how much your income will be over this time and, and support people to enable them to make that choice. But with a fundamental principle in there that you provide the financial security for simple things like keeping, being able to afford your rent, because any welfare system that transitions to something that you can suddenly no longer afford your rent isn't worth it being called a benefit system in itself. 
And uh, just to echo that point about um, restoring that support, I know Citizens Advice and Children's Society's uh, proposal around the sort of self-care element, I think particularly for the losses we're seeing, something so that disabled people living independently don't face any of those risks would be the way you'd, you'd avoid any of this. Uh, but just also on, on that point about specialist advice, um, I think there's also um, the department needs to think more widely about how it's using its resources here because we know under universal credit there is more conditionality, there's day one conditionality, people are more often being required to come into meetings with work coaches. But if people are being required to have those interactions whilst they still haven't really had in advance the basic financial advice and advice about their benefits to understand what's going on, um, not only is that really bad for people's experiences, it's undermining what the department's trying to do as well because people really understandably aren't in a place to be thinking about their return to work if they're actually dealing with the pretty bruising experience of how they've moved on to universal credit. So I think the department shouldn't see it as an either or between increasing the specialist kind of trained advice on benefits and what they want to do around uh, employment support because you need the first one for the second one to even get off the ground. Okay. We would agree with the, the self-care. Okay, thank you. But, well, thank you. But might that idea of Steve's be taken up? You have di- various fora, don't you, with like poverty lobbies and so on, that whether the consumer law can actually be applied here that people are sold something and they find out it's not what they're sold. Um, would we have? Would those are claimants have? Are they paying for it? Um, yeah. um, I, I think that's the own of kid that approach because this is about this takes away the benefit system is and the work coaches are about supporting people. We've mm-hmm. seen a, such a shift in culture within job centres of here to help rather than we're issuing benefits and we're gatekeeping. But the problem is those here to help work coaches aren't equipped to deal with this transition and they don't understand the details of benefits. So, you know, I wouldn't want it to move to a customer transaction. It's about the, the benefit system being a springboard to help you back into a, a place of security. Yeah, I, mean, I, think, I, I wouldn't want it to go down that route either, but I think your point about no way back, my, my feeling is there must be a way back because in essence, you have been advised to make the wrong decision. Uh, and there's not too many circumstances I can think of where somebody says, you'd be really well advised to do this. Oh, by the way, I got it wrong. <laughs> but you're stuck. <laughs> I mean, that's what you're, yeah. you're getting at, isn't it? Yeah. We have to find some way of saying that. And it seems to me mm-hmm. if you had a basic flagging system that showed it, as you suggest, and it became obvious that you, the person had acted in good faith, but it was wrong, mm. then you should simply be able to say we'll start again. Mm. Or it's sure that you have the income you need. I think that's, that, that's the fundamental yes, point, yes. isn't it? Rather than <laughs> yeah, bringing it back to a system that you'll have to move to. Thank you very much for your contributions. Thank you. Introduce yourself um, for the sake of the record, and then Heidi will begin the questioning. I'm, uh, I'm Phil Agulnick. I'm a director of Entitle2, and uh, we produce a benefit calculator and various other tools to help benefit claimants. That's a good start. Thank you. Heidi. Thank you. I think your website is a bit of a, a bit folklore, isn't it? Um, I don't, folklore is the wrong word. Um, what do I mean? Um, a fab place that people find when they, they know about so? it. I don't, I'm trying to think of the right word. I don't mean folklore. Um, um, an undiscovered secret when people find it. Um, it does a really good job. And what you've heard, I'm sure, in the first panel already, is how difficult it is for people to realise. How widely available are websites like yours known? How, how do people go and find the information for themselves to know if they'll be better off or worse off? So, um, so the government has a, a page on the .gov site which advertises benefit calculators. That's one way, or people just put into Google benefit calculator or a search term like universal credit and we'll be there somewhere. Mm. So, I, I, but I don't, there's no, um, it, it's not part of the claims process, yeah. I believe. 
Um, but um, what about people who don't have Google, who don't have credit on their phone, who don't have IT skills? Yeah, so we, we provide software for advisors as well as for, so there's a self-serve version and there's an advisor version, so people who can't do it themselves. We're facilitating advice from, from uh, real people. So, so how well are you known across the um, sort of the third sector, like Citizens Advice, for example? Would they, re if a person came in, would they recommend you to them? Uh, they, hopefully, they might recommend other places to go. Mm. But yeah, I think we're reasonably well known. I think people will use us or the other available benefit calculators to do things like better off calculations. And do you have any sense across um, the service that you provide and other similar? Um, services as to how, how many people that are coming to you as opposed to those that are just ending up moving on to universal credit blindly if you like? So uh, the, the thing is we can't tell the pe whether people are using our calculator for its kind of original purpose which is income maximisation or for the purpose which we've kind of twisted it to which is to get information about universal credit and we do have some information does about... does that mean, sorry, I don't understand what you mean by just it to... As in, so, so really, before universal credit, the benefit <coughs> calculators were all about saying, are you entitled to such and such a benefit? Yeah. And so really what you're trying to do is you're trying to take someone's circumstances and compare it to criteria and say <coughs> you're entitled to X and overall the big aim is to reduce the £20 billion which goes unclaimed. So that's where we started. And then because of welfare reform, we've then got a need to try and give people information about welfare reform. And then on top of that, you've got information about natural migration and triggers. So the kind of jobs that we're trying to do are kind of expanding. So a lot of the problem here is just sheer amount of information. So even if you can give people correct information, there's still an awful lot to absorb. So we're always trying to manage the information on the results page to kind of keep to the main job, which is what are you entitled to, can you maximise your income, but also provide information about whether you're better or worse off under UC and about triggers. But there's a real, real problem about the amount of information. Okay, and what tools do um, work coaches and job centres have to help claimants understand so I believe that a lot of them use our public calculator. Um, Yours? Yeah, but they, there are other ones are available. Well, we know that quite a lot use us, yeah. Okay, but of course by the time somebody's got an appointment with a work coach, it's too late because it means they've successfully registered for universal credit. Uh, yeah, if, if, if they've done that, but again, I mean, I can't tell whether people are checking before they go on to universal credit and whether, because uh, yeah, the impression one gets is essentially the event happens, the life event happens, and then it's about, you know, what happens next. So um, people can, and some do, find out beforehand about what's going on, and particularly if they're planning something in their life, that makes a lot of sense. But obviously a lot of things aren't planned. You get evicted, yeah. something happens. Life changes in some way that you hadn't anticipated. So you, you are providing a self-help service, you're not pulling the data out for analysis purposes or anything like that? No, correct. Okay. It's, it's, it's just a questionnaire that people fill in and give results. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Chris? Yes, thanks. Um, can, can I just ask you, Phil, then, um, do you think it's worth continuing the Universal Credit Helpline when the information provided to claimants is often inaccurate? I'm terribly sorry, I, c I cannot comment on that. I know nothing about the Universal Credit Helpline and, and what they do. Okay, I'm terribly sorry. Have you never as just in, in, um, inquisitive about it, looking at other products which are challenging yours? <clears throat> um, I, I, I just haven't, because what we're doing is provide numbers essentially about different situations the actual universal credit helpline and what they do is all part of the claims process i.e we're not we're not hand holding particular individuals all the way through their claim we're kind of doing a small bit which are what are the numbers attached to this claim does that, does that help? Okay, so who, okay I'll, I'll ask you another question then phil whose responsibility should it be to provide claimants with where they're moving on to universal credit is better for them than not um, so, 
I think um, I think that responsibility doesn't exist at the moment. Um, so I think the regulations for moving on to credit aren't about whether you're better or worse off. They're about whether you've had this particular change of circumstance. So it isn't anyone's responsibility at the moment. You could make it a responsibility. Uh, that would lead you down the road of saying, and that's because we only want people who are either actual bet better off under universal credit to go on to it. So should someone have the responsibility for it? And who should it be? If, if you wanted to change how natural migration worked, which would be a very sensible thing to do, that would be an option. But it's, you can't, you're doing it the other way around. You're, if you're saying, rather than natural migration applying to anyone with all these change of circumstances, we're going to try and restrict that group. And if you did that, you could do a better off calculation. Whether you want people to do a better off calculation and say, you're a lot worse off under universal credit, but can we have your claim form anyway? I don't know. But yeah, you, you, you could have a system where you force people to check if they're better off and only have winners going through. Okay. But that would be a proper thing to do, wouldn't it, given that this is the first reform of moving people from a clutch of benefits or a benefit to a new one, where they're going to be worse off. Um, I mean, as I said to the previous group, I, never in my ex experience have we actually had a reform where you've got to make a calculation of whether you're worse off or not. When we moved from supplementary benefits to income support, people, you had the certainty that everybody was going to be better off, even if only by a small amount. I, 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 I completely agree about the nature of transition protection being mm. very difficult, and, and what's doubly difficult is the nature of coming off transition protection because in the past, inflation was taking care of a lot of the problem and just floating people off. So the freeze, essentially 20% inflation would get rid of it after a few years. But because of the way temporary protection works in terms of all the problems with then leaving it, which have got equivalent unfairnesses to when you go on to it, you've kind of got this, this problem that the, the transitional protection system, as outlined, it's, not, it's never really going to work. Transition protection is always going to be a system that is not working in terms of getting people onto it and not really working when people then come off it. Mm. And, and really having different rates in different systems is what's causing a lot of the fundamental problem. Really, there's one question about aligning benefit rates and then there's another question about the way you administer benefits. Steve? Um, yeah, two things. Uh, just following on from that, I mean, do you have a view on what the department could do to ensure that people uh, don't transfer and end up worse off? So there's this confusion about whether some people end up with universal credit who don't need to, or if they were better advised, would remain with legacy benefits. And the argument seems to be people don't get properly advised and they end up finding out when it's too late. Do you have a view on what the department could do? So, um, I, th I think fundamentally, you've really got a problem about having cuts to benefits introduced via a migration process, mm -hmm. which operates in a random, essentially random way, or feels to be random. So. You could have a system which divided it into winners and losers, but essentially you're going down a system of saying we're going to have a universal credit system for this group of people and a legacy benefit system for these people, which might be perfectly sensible. Uh, and indeed you could argue that universal credit was intended for people with good work prospects or in and out of work and isn't particularly intended for people with poor work prospects uh, because all the reforms don't particularly help if you're not moving in and out of work, it's not the intention. So if you went down that route, you'd be going down a route of saying we're going to extend the current gateway. And you've got this very simple extension, which is the extension to everyone with a disability, which was the point made by my colleagues earlier and the people last week. And that would be a very simple way of just reducing the scale of the problem. But it doesn't get you at the fundamental issue, which is if you're going to cut benefits, you can kind of do it for everyone at once, 
or you can do it from a particular date, but you probably can't do it on whether you happen to move into that street in this borough or that street over there in a different borough because people perceive it to be unfair and included within that perception of unfairness by people is also successful challenges in the court against that postcode effect within it. So as a mechanism for bringing in reduced benefits, even if you agree that it's correct that we shouldn't have the severe disability payment and it's correct that disabled children had too generous a rate, you need to do that directly, either through saying it's for all new claims from X or it's for everyone or we're going to freeze it for 10 years. But effectively you're introducing a cut in an arbitrary way because the idea that the change of circumstance will kind of dominate what's going on. Uh, it may be true when you're moving into work, a bunch of other things are changing, but if you're just moving house because you've been evicted and you suddenly get a cut, that doesn't seem like a change of circumstance. Uh, and indeed, if you're having a change of circumstance because you've been widowed, it might just be a very inappropriate time to introduce a benefit cut. So I think, basically, I think there's a fundamental flaw in trying to introduce cuts via the natural migration mechanism. There's the philosophy itself behind it, yes. Can, can I just ask a little bit about entitled to you? I, I, I don't know too much about you, but you've been on the go since, what, 2000, and people who use the calculators, it's free to use them. Where, where do you get your funding from? So we, we sell our products to housing associations and local authorities. So local authorities who still administer housing benefit and something called council tax support, um, they want to ensure that the people who apply are going to have an entitlement. So it saves their time if they can check for eligibility and it saves the consumer's time. So that's, it's this licensing to local authorities and housing. Okay, thank you, thank you. As you gave us just prior to that answer um, about um, the dangers of introducing cuts in this arbitrary way, we'll feature in our report. Huge thanks. Mm -hmm for making it so clear. Good. We're grateful to you for coming. Thank you very much Thank for you. having me. Thank you.